the onto bridge. Ray shields now. We cannot comply. We surrender. Board us. Take us into custody. Just do not fire. Where is Pink? She's gone. We damage her propeller. What do we do? Why? Why is this happening to me? Why? And then we are going to accidentally break one of them in half. Wait, no, no, that that. Mom! So the last time we spoke about the south end of the Water of Leaf, which included two castles, lots of mills and a reservoir. But today the river is going to get a lot more built up, which of course means there's a lot more stuff. But today we are going to start with two very impressive bridges. So when one thinks of Slateford, they usually think of either Chesarasta, the station, or these two bridges that carry the canal and the line to car stairs respectively. I've only been across the railway bridge a couple of times on the train, but the aqueduct is something I am far more familiar with as a cyclist, and to be honest, I hate crossing it. It's high up, the towpath is narrow, you have to get your bike to cross, which makes life harder if someone is going across their direction and people racing bikes think that they have to cycle across at everyone else's inconvenience because they must get from point A to point B as fast as possible because fitness. <sighs> this is the difference between cycling for fitness and cycling for transport. Anyway, other than the canal bridge being terrible for literally everyone not on the boat, these two bridges have an interesting history. The first to be built was the aqueduct, obviously, and the thing about the canal is I feel it was really poorly timed. It was in the planning stages since at least 1817, but by the time it opened in 1822, railways were developing so quickly that at one point there was a proposal to run a railway along the towpath. The Edinburgh to Glasgow Railway opened two decades later and that diminished it as a form of transport. The aqueduct was completed pretty much as the canal opened in 1822 and it was built by Hugh Baird but modelled on Thomas Telford's aqueduct at Chirk on the Ellesmere Canal which interestingly enough also has a railway viaduct running next to it. But anyway, its railway counterpart was built around 1848 for the Caledonian Railway Line to Princess Street, or as it was back then, Lothian Road. The Caledonian Line doesn't really follow the line of the canal, in fact it leaves the canal after Wester Hales, and the line of the canal more closely follows the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway, but it does go to show how quickly things moved from the water to the rails. we need to talk about Stenhouse. You can tell a lot about a place from its name, and while Stenhouse is not the most salubrious area, it has one place of interest. This is Stenhouse Mansion, and this is the house that gave Stenhouse its name. Let me explain. What we now today call Stenhouse Mansion began life as Stenhope's Mills and was built in 1623. Its name comes from the Stenhope family who until 1621 owned the lands around the area. Now interestingly, the house was not built by the Stenhope family but by Patrick Ellis, a burgess of Edinburgh. So Stenhope eventually was corrupted into Stenhouse. Today, it is owned by the National Trust for Scotland, but it's not open to the public. However, it was still occupied, although in a deteriorating state, in 1920, according to one report. Weirdly enough, it came into the hands of the Greyhound Racing Trust, who in 1937 gave the house over to the National Trust for Scotland. What the Greyhound Racing Trust was doing with the house, I'm not too sure. Now this is where things get weird. In 1965 it was restored but the National Trust still didn't want to open to the public because, well, I suspect it didn't have too many old furnishings anymore. 
so they basically rented it out to Historic Scotland who used it as a centre for conservation of paintings and carved stones. This continued until 2009 when Historic Scotland moved out, but the NTS still maintains the place. Now the inside seems quite interesting. Apparently there is a room in the house known as the King Charles Room with a panel commemorating the restoration of the monarchy. You might find a lot of things like that in the houses of this era. The 17th century was a really rough time for all and sundry full of religious violence, genocide, war and a lot of government tyranny. And by that I don't mean, oh, they made people wear masks or they won't let be dickheads and minorities. No, I mean lots of state murder. So when all of this apparently ended, people obviously commemorated it, although it never really properly ended because the ramifications of it all still resonate to this day. Anyway, it all seems very odd and I wonder if it would be open to the public because it does seem like a hidden gem. You can't really miss this one, mainly because if you're going into the city centre from the west, you genuinely cannot. Murrayfield Stadium is pretty much Edinburgh's biggest stadium and it is a home ground of the Scottish rugby team. Now I have a passing interest in rugby mainly because my dad watches it and as a sport it's quite interesting, more so than football. There's more action in rugby and although it has been seen as a slightly posh sport, ironically, it's genuinely just more interesting to watch. I would rather watch 30 bears chasing a giant testicle than 22 twinks chasing after an orb. Wait, what? When people ask what are 15 guys doing sticking their heads between each other's thighs, we'll just tell them that we're practicing. Anyway, according to the 1892 OS map, Murrayfield started out life as a pole ground. Somehow meaning Murrayfield's origins are in a sport somehow posher than rugby. In 1911, the ground was bought by the Scottish Rugby Union. Games were previously played at Inverleaf, but the ground there was struggling to accommodate spectators. Murrayfield started out as a stand in free embankments, and construction took three years to complete. Then World War I broke out, meaning the first international was played at Murrayfield in 1925 against England, and in a shocking twist, Scotland beat England to win its first Five Nations Grand Slam. The Five Nations eventually became the Sixth Nations if you are curious. During the Second World War, the ground at Murrayfield was offered to the nation and it was taken over by the Royal Army Service Corps who used it as a supply depot. During the war years, the armed forces managed to arrange two Scotland vs England Services Internationals each year on a home and away basis. Scotland's home matches were played at Inverleaf for the first two years, with a return to Murrayfield in 1944 after the ground's derequisition. The stadium was upgraded in 1991 to become the stadium that we all know today, and is today Scotland's largest stadium for any sport. Sorry, Hamden. It's also the only stadium to have its own mass transit stop in Edinburgh Murrayfield tram stop, which becomes a mosh pit on match days. East Rogers have its own station, but that closed in 1967. And it's here that we take our leave for next month. See you then!